Good evening, everyone. We're going to call to order the August 25th, 2014 City Council meeting. If you'll please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, Miss Looper here. Yes, she is. There she is with a wellness proclamation or presentation. Good evening. I'm Christy Looper, Human Resources Manager for the City of Stillwater. And I wanted to just give a little bit of a brief overview. We started our wellness initiative over one year ago. And so we wanted to take the opportunity to recognize our employees' investment to that program. Our employees have participated in numerous wellness challenges and programs over the last year, and we have celebrated many personal health successes. Our fitness facility has over 390 members, and we still average about 20 to 25 visits every day from those members. Our Steps Hall of Fame board in the hallway includes the names of numerous 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, and 5 million steppers. We then had to add room for those with six million, and Sherry Hughes still currently leads the way with nine million steps. That's all in the last year. We have 266 participants in our public Fitbit group. Those are those who opted in to have their information public on that board. Those members have knocked out over 19 million steps and almost 9,000 miles. When I say 19 million steps and 9,000 miles, that was just the first 20 days of August. This program has been featured on the news in the statewide worksite wellness guide, and our employees have headlined 11 editions of the journal record and have at least more, three more features planned. The city also obtained our status of certified healthy business from the Turning Point Council. So tonight we wanna to say thank you to the council and the city manager's office for support of that wellness initiative. We wanna say a huge congratulations to our employees who have made their health a top priority and we wanted to recognize Mayor Bartley, who achieved his five million steps just last week. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for the support. Our employees have responded overwhelmingly. We continue to have new programs and initiatives, and um, our pedometers and our steps are all over the place, and we're seeing healthy gains from division to division. Thank you. Hey, quick, quick question. Yes. Um, and I, we talked about this during the budget time, but mm -hmm. I think this is a great opportunity to kind of hit on it again. For this year's budget, when we enacted this year's budget, we did not have an increase in our health insurance rates. We did not. I'm not asking you to prove it. <laughs> but there's got to be some sort of connection between the wellness initiatives that we have implemented and the fact that we did not have an increase in our insurance rates. Everybody else saw a lot of increases. Um, we talked to our rep or our broker during the insurance renewals and she said it wasn't unusual for them to have double digit increases. So typically your return on investment on a wellness program is three to five years, but we had impacts high and hard. We've already know personal stories of employees coming off of medications, of family members coming off medications, tons and tons of weight loss and just healthier well-being from our employees in their activities and things like that so we're going to take that and say that's what caused us um nobody can disprove it <laughs> so we're going to say that was the only thing that we made a change on this year was really a, a hard-hitting high-reaching fitness program and wellness initiative and the first year that we had it in place is that year that we don't have those premium increases so thank you guys very much thank you That's going to take us down to the consent docket. And we have one item on the consent docket, the approval of minutes. Someone wish to remove that item from the consent docket? If not, is there a motion on the consent docket? Motion to approve the consent docket. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. And that is approved four to zero. And I guess I should have stated that Councillor Darlington is not present this evening, so there are only four votes to be recorded. Okay. That's going to take us down to public hearings. And our first public hearing is actually public hearing number two 
for the proposed Stillwater North Perkins project plan and establishment of increment financing district number one for the city of Stillwater. Mr. Dorman, do we have good notice on this? Yes, sir. Thank you. Galloway. Yeah, you know, at this point, I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Dan Bachelor to the podium uh, again. Again, Mr. Bachelor is uh, attorney at law from the Center for Economic Development Law in Oklahoma City. He's uh, been under a contract with us, assisting us through this first uh, TIF uh, development process. Uh, Mr. Bachelor was instrumental in assisting the legislators, I think, a little bit with writing some of the statutory changes back in 04, which made these uh, districts uh, compatible in Oklahoma. So I'd like to ask Mr. Baxter to give us a brief overview of the project plan that's contained in the TIF and then we can uh, entertain questions uh, from the council and open up to a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, distinguished members of the council. I am Dan Batchelor. I'm the chairman of the Center for Economic Development Law. Is the, ours is a small firm that specializes in assisting communities in their development and redevelopment endeavors, including the legal structure of project plans, the formulation of tax increment district, and other related activities to enable a project to occur. Uh, at your request, uh, we were engaged to assist in the preparation of a proposed project plan uh, for consideration by the City of Stillwater. This project plan uh, is intended to uh, nourish or support commercial development on a tract of approximately 11 and a half acres at the northwest corner of the intersection of North Perkins Road and Lakeview Road. Um, under the terms of the project plan, if approved, the project will support the development of approximately 100,000 uh, square feet of uh, commercial uh, space it will authorize the uh, payment purely through tax increments of the authorized public cost in connection with the project. In order for this project plan to be approved under Oklahoma's Constitution and Local Development Act, these things are required. First of all, the proposed project plan must be submitted to a review committee that contains at least three representatives out of a committee of seven representing the public at large. That review committee is charged with the responsibilities, number one, of making its recommendation with respect to the eligibility of the proposed project, number two, uh, making its recommendation uh, with respect to the impact on any affected taxing jurisdiction, and in that case, the sole affected taxing jurisdiction is the city of Stillwater, and number three, making its recommendation with respect to the desirability of the proposed project plan. In accordance with the Oklahoma Local Development Act, uh, at the direction of this, of this council, a review committee was convened that considered its statutory responsibilities and recommended approval of the project, found the proposed project to be eligible, desirable, and to have a beneficial impact on the city of Stillwater. Uh, your city planning commission found that the proposed project conforms with the comprehensive plan for the city of Stillwater. And as the law requires, this is the second of two public hearings. The first, which was held two weeks ago, uh, we discussed and pre presented at some length the contents of the project plan and were available to respond to questions regarding uh, that proposed plan. So this is the second hearing, and this is the hearing at which this council, under the Oklahoma Local Development Act, is empowered to take action following the conclusion of the public hearing. Uh, the project uh, anticipates uh, generating some 13 to 15 million dollars in new development. The public sector costs of the project that are authorized for, under the project plan, if approved, would be not to exceed the lesser of $3.4 million or 25% of the total project cost. Under the terms of the project plan and the conditional development agreement with the developer, all costs in connection with the project are to be advanced by the private developer. The public cost then would later be reimbursed, but only as uh, tax increments are generated from the commercial activity within the project area and that reimbursement is limited to the taxes that are generated by 1% of the, 
of the sales, that, that amounts to about 50% of your undedicated sales tax rate, that 1% could be, would be used to repay the advance cost over a period not to exceed 15 years. So this is a project plan which contemplates the support of a commercial development. It has been found to be eligible by the review committee. Uh, and based on our review of the project plan and the agreement, we recommend it to you for your approval. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to respond. Any questions for Mr. Bachelor? No, that's the same. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we will open the, the public hearing. And I have one, two, five requests to speak for this public hearing. Uh, first request is from a Dorothy Spivey. Do I stand up here? Yes, ma'am. And uh, be, I say before you get started, I was going to say I was going to give everyone the, the the rundown on how I should have said this before I called your name. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, up here on is is that timer going to work up there? It will work tonight. Yes. Okay. That the the small screen right there should have the clock, the, the timer. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you start speaking, the timer will start. And when it uh, expires, that doesn't mean you must stop mid-word, but at that point, if you'd wrap up that thought, and then uh, council may have questions for you or, th or they, they may not. It, is and that considered in the time period? No, ma'am. That's extra. Okay. And so, and the way we're gonna get started with each, each speaker is if you'd please state your name and then the address that you put on, on the form so we have that in the public record. You know? I am Dorothy Spivey, and I've lived in Stillwater for about 45 years at the same address, 2222 West 11th. Um, and this is uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, 74074. Is that considered part of my time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I was going to uh, address broad core issues. Uh, it does seem to me that commercial, quote, is um, a, too much a money value system and I think it's um, national international uh, I would like to note that uh, we had earlier in Stillwater separated communities with uh, commercial versus uh, I forget the other term but we'll say domestic private homes children playgrounds things so it seems to me that um, usually our um, Elected officials are tending to be, perhaps unintentionally, commercially money-oriented. And what I loved about this community always, uh, my husband was connected with the university, um, that we did have young students um, at, welcomed at different areas. Uh, we also had lovely, um, safe ways a child could walk to their little school. And uh, as long as they were within a mile, they would have to be under their own transportation or driven or taken by a parent. And I'd always loved, compared to where I'd come in a bigger city, that it was such a safe, um, comfortable region. And this is always a bother to me. I also, through living here for years, have noticed floodplain has been continually um, sort of ignored. And I live in an area that had a natural creek running behind my house. I didn't know that because it was overfilled, but my neighbor who lived across the street had been one of the first homes in that area. And she told me there was a natural creek. And it turns out where I live off Western, um, there is a creek by Myers Park. And this creek would uh, have, uh, from two sides of it, streets slanting into it, naturally tilting. And when you had a flood period, this would be amazing. Like in one or two hours, you could have, because of the drain off, the creek would overfill, overrun into the road, into the houses at the lower levels. Uh, this seems to be uh, sort of ignored because it occurs like every seven to 10 years that a bad problem develops. Um, so I do feel we are not respectful enough of a basic nature, say, in Moore, um, we have been told it was a tornado alley. This is nature. 
uh, to rebuild again there. I, you notice the insurance companies do not want to cover it. They know better. They watch their money. Uh, they, um, I think sentimentally, people I can understand, but I think it's not wise. Um, I um, also feel that um, we uh, do not address and inform our public I think we are too rushed to consider. We are picking as what we read because we have so much information. Um, we do have one issue that sort of has piggybacked um, side effects that we just don't address. And so I think almost accidentally, we don't get well informed as a public, but also it allows a person unintentionally to be more dishonest. Um, mean. Um, when you speak of your physical improvements uh, plan, a step plan, that means walking, does it? And I do feel that our basic domestic life, our uh, habits, our um, mental health are all interrelated. And I found kind of amused by the terms when she says walking. Uh, and side effect, insurance hasn't increased. Well, insurance is a business. They base their money, their business on money. And of course, they want us to, in a way, be convinced that we might need their insurance in case of ill health, but they really, to run a profit business, are hoping that we remain healthy. So I think it's all interreacted, and we are too narrow-minded and rushed. Am I within my time? Yes, right. Any questions? Our next speaker is Chris Norris. All right, Chris Norris, 3104 South Deer Creek. Um, thank you for allowing us to have this public input on uh, these situations. Uh, I'd heard a week or so ago that I had been contacted about being for this project and I was a little surprised and I was like well I need to kind of set maybe a record straight uh, that nothing really could be further from the truth and just to give you uh, I have absolutely zero problem with competition competitions what has made I think this country better and this city better I have a real problem with what I see as government sponsored competition uh, my background a little bit, and I'll touch on that in a minute. It's 28 years in Stillwater at Chris's University Spirit. And when I started, uh, number one, I was naive enough to have no idea that I could ask for some maybe preferential treatment, okay? And number two, I never would have thought about asking a commission to give me an unfair advantage over my competitors and put you guys in a position where you basically discriminate against others that don't get the same breaks. Uh, so I never, I never would have, have, have thought of that. Uh, and now it appears for me from what I've read and what I've observed that we've got a, an entity from South Carolina that has come in and is asking you guys to discriminate against people here that have paid millions in sales tax dollars, especially, and I know I have over 28 years, and I know 3.5 of that goes to you guys, and that's obviously not millions, but it's hundreds of thousands. So I just would like you to look at that and not be in the business of picking winners and those that have to compete in a little bit different form. Uh, you know, I, when I look at government, I think, honestly, it's in the business of leveling playing fields, not picking winners and losers. And, I, you know, I'm not asking for a favor. All I'm asking, honestly, is for fairness. And, again, thanks for your time for allowing us to speak. Our next speaker is Chad Watkins. Hi, my name is Chad Watkins. I live at 1123 West uh, uh, Pecan Lake Court. Um, lifelong Stillwater resident, been here my whole life. My brother Jeff and I own Dupree Sports here in town. 
And basically, I'm not a great public speaker, so I'm not going to be up here long, but I, I would like to echo most of what Chris said. It's kind of, he stole most of my thunder. So I, you know, I, we've, we've been in business for about 50 years now and never have received any tax benefits or anything that I'm aware of. We've never asked for anything. We've just tried to be, you know, good community members and, um, and I just, we feel a little bit betrayed by this action. We want, we want, we don't mind competition either, but we, we would like to play on an even playing field. Is is all we ask. So, um, and that's really all I have to say. And our next speaker is Scott Johnson. My name is Scott Johnson. I live at 1501 North Skyline, so about a mile away from the proposed district. I'm also a professor in the business school at uh, OSU. And so I guess I'm interested in this from both my neighborhood and from, from a business point of view. So as a business professor, I certainly understand why a developer would ask for $3.4 million to help um, start a business. Um, I certainly would encourage all of my business students to do that uh, if they were starting a business. Um, from, a, from my perspective as a taxpayer, I'm trying to understand why we would do that as a city. So why would my tax money go towards that? And so I, I have two questions. I don't know if, if there's a, a, a mechanism for answering questions or not, but I have two questions. Um, I, just back of the envelope calculations, it looks like $3.4 million um, being repaid uh, with the 1% sales tax implies something like $34 million in sales for the next 10 years to, um, to, to finance that. So my first question is, if, if these companies are going to have $34 million in sales per year, why can't they pay for the cost of uh, their stores or the um, whatever's going to go in there? Um, and then my second question is, this amount of sales added to that, uh, that corner of uh, Lakeview and Perkins, um, there's this statement in the proposal that it will not result in any measurable increase in demand for services by the city, and I'm trying to understand how that could possibly be. Um, it's already on the busiest street in Stillwater. Um, I hear has the, the most accidents in Stillwater. Um, so we're adding $34 million more in sales um, there. And so I, I just, so those are my two questions. How, 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 well, the first question is why, why would we pay this money for the companies? Um, especially given the fact that we've had many other companies locate there in, recent, in the last five years. So we've had um, Aldi's, Cavenders, Panda, El Camino have all gone into that area. Um, so why do we have to pay for th these new companies to come in? Um, and then how is it that there wouldn't be any additional costs incurred by the city if this comes in? Okay. Will you address the second question? And that was in, in turn, the question was in terms of services. Uh, yeah, there will, there will be additional impacts uh, to services such as the streets, be traffic on the streets. The uh, developer uh, of the division would be required to have an engineer's traffic study conducted and if there are additional traffic um, needs such as turn lanes, traffic signals, they will, it will be the developer's responsibility to install those at their cost and dedicate those to the city. Um, other services, we have ample water and sewer in the area that will accommodate the service so there's no additional increase in developing new water and sewer services for it because we have ample service for that. Uh, fire, police protection, planning services, those services aren't significantly impacted. So when you say it's a broad scope of city services and uh, any direct physical impacts on service such as the traffic would be borne, improvements would be borne by the developer. Uh, as was mentioned earlier about flood drainage, for example, we have requirements that they would uh, contain any additional storm runoff on their property. So that does not impact our stormwater system. Thank you. Um, on on the first question, I I think 
really the the way you pose the question I think is going to be answered by a vote that will be occurring and any explanation at that point but I think part of the answer is going to be that I, I don't the way and this may just be the way you, the question was asked but nothing in this project plan and nothing in this TIF district addresses a specific store it is a development that this plan is dealing with and so it is bigger than one store you name very specific one companies that have come in this is a, a larger project than just one company and I think there's a differentiation there I think there's gonna be some good discussion here in a little bit that I think will each counselor would will have the opportunity if they choose to take it to address why they are going to be voting in the way that they'll be voting on your, on your first question. Our last request to speak is from Roger Ghost. Roger Ghost, 113 East State. I want to disclose I am the engineer on this development, but that's not why I'm here to speak. Um, I'm also the chairman of the infrastructure committee at the chamber. And for about a year, year and a half, I've been trying to get these increment financing districts up and back on the table for consideration. Um, several administrations ago in city council, there was some work done to try to resurrect those and it, it never went very far. Um, I think we had a seminar in this room maybe a year ago on TIF financing. Um, it was lots of folks in the room from the community but I think with TIF whether and I'm not advocating sales tax um, or what kind of funding mechanism uh, but that's going to be the, the way that we get this community improved we don't have the money we don't have the we don't have the budget extend sewer and water lines anymore like we did when the EPA was writing checks all the time that's how a lot of people currently live here got sewers to within reach of their neighborhoods um, the um, and our water lines are wearing out and our streets are wearing out and um, unfortunately we don't have enough property tax coming to the city to make TIFs based on property tax a real viable thing for the city if we can get the other entities that are involved in those TIFs to forego their tax for three to five years then we can get some improvements made, like the streets around some of these big apartment complexes, the sewer, the water. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but downtown Oklahoma City, around the Devon Tower, I think it's eight blocks by eight blocks, um, that's a, over a $100 million TIF district. And the TIF is being funded or repaid by the incremental tax increase that the Devon Tower caused on that property and they replace the sewer, the water, the gas lines, the electric, the streets, the landscaping, all of that hardscape downtown around the Devon, they rebuilt the Marriott, I think it's the Marriott Gardens, the tube. All of that was a TIF, and it was based, I believe that one's all off of their property tax down there. So it's a, it's a way of funding things. Um, if nothing goes on this corner or if nothing goes on some of these corners over towards campus where apartments are being built, those properties are going to sit there and they're going to rock along at a low tax rate, low property tax. This, pro I mean, even this property would have been good for a uh, TIF based on property tax. It, it just wasn't in the mix this time. So those are something I hope to be pursuing in the next year through the chamber and maybe we can see more of these. and. Uh, I, I support some kind of TIF concept. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is all of the speaking requests that we received, and so we will close the public hearing. Okay. Um, can I call Mr. Well, we have additional questions for Mr. Bachelor. Of course, the. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> recommendation from the Planning Commission and from the uh, TIF Review Committee to the Council is for, uh, for the establishment of the TIF District. Uh, 
that resolution was passed by council on first reading two weeks ago. So your uh, consideration tonight would be to approve the or consider approval of the ordinance creating the TIF district on second reading this evening. And that's the recommendation of, uh, again, Planning Commission, TIF Review Committee, staff. Um, I, I do have a, a question or two for Mr. Batchelor, if you wouldn't mind returning to the podium. Um, and these questions really more are in general, not our specific plan that's proposed. Uh, the, you, you heard the, the, the comments from the speakers. And I, I know this is not your first TIF district to be involved in. No. Uh, the comments are, are, are very pertinent. And we've, we've hired you to advise us on TIF districts in general and most specifically ours. How, how, what is, how, how do you address some of these questions on unfairness and picking winners, losers, those type of things? My opinion uh, and my experience says that the public decision about the desirability of development of an area requires you to take into consideration a range of, of things. Number one, does the area need to be developed? Is it your uh, plan that a particular property or area be developed? If so, are there handicaps or impediments to that development? How can those impediments or obstacles to development be overcome? And often that involves the need for uh, some range of public improvements to make uh, a project possible. Uh, I think your comment uh, earlier on uh, during the uh, uh, public hearing is uh, pertinent, Mr. Mayor, which is that the focus of the judgment before you is, uh, is on the development not the later participants in the development. I will have to say that you know some areas are much more difficult to uh, develop than others, uh, but that judgment of the importance of the development to the community is a public judgment. Secondly, uh, commercial development uh, has been considerably, more, involving retailers in particular, has been considerably more difficult uh, since the uh, recession that began in 08, the ways in which uh, retailers do business makes it much more difficult from a financing point of view for the developer, the real estate developer, to make a project work. And the reason that is true is that all of the businesses are operating on narrower margins. Uh, retail businesses, uh, are very unlikely today to provide percentage rents or inducements to the developer that hinge on the success of the retail business. They simply want the lowest fixed rent possible and they want the developer to build the facility so that the retailer does not have the capital uh, investment requirement there. So conditions that handicap real estate development in the commercial world have become much more difficult over the last six years. So that is a factor. So under the uh, Local Development Act, you look to see if a property is undeveloped or underdeveloped, if uh, the development of that p property needs to be nourished or supported as a part of your uh, development plan for the community. If the need to do that and the financial assistance requested is reasonable, and if the terms of providing that assistance do not impose an undue burden on the community. If you go through those tests uh, and you conclude, yes, it is desirable, then you may decide to accept the recommendation of your review committee, which is the reason you created uh, and established the review committee in the first place. Some of these judgments are more difficult than others, but I will give you an example of one circumstance where it was not the developer, but it was the business. Uh, and uh, the decision was made that the attraction of that business was so important to the community that it was worth offering uh, a degree of uh, financial support for that to occur. And that was the attraction 
of the uh, Bass Pro Shops to uh, the core of Oklahoma City. The agreement there was that the facility would be built for that business and then it would simply pay a rent, but it had a percentage rent component. There was an inducement to do that. But the reasons that that was, uh, step was taken were these. Number one, that was an old, rundown industrial area. There were dreams of creating it as a Bricktown Entertainment Center, but it was not then. And no major uh, retailer could be, had been induced or could be persuaded to come into that blighted, rundown area. So that was a strong reason for the first objective. The second was that that particular business had a reputation and a history of attracting a wide range of clientele from an area up to 100 miles from its location. Thus, it held the potential of bringing additional business into the community. The third thing and factor was that, that that business never, ever located in the heart of cities. All of, its suburb, all of its locations were suburban. And to this day, that Bass Pro Shop in Oklahoma City is the only one in a central city core location. What happened because of that decision was it became the first major component of what you now see as the Bricktown Entertainment Center, which is a range of attractions including uh, restaurants and hotels and uh, other attractions that have made that area really blossom and bring in the tourists. But I give you that illustration to say that this is a policy judgment that is focused on development, not on favoritism to a particular retailer. Questions, Mr. Bachelor? Thank you. Okay. Given your recommendation, and then when we get down to, I guess, do you guys want to discuss this now or do you want to wait till we get to ordinances? Which is where the. <clears throat> which is where we usually that, discuss it. That's where the, the, yeah. that's where the action is, is that's down fine. on ordinances. Mm -hmm. Wait till ordinances? That's fine. Okay. Did I ever close the public hearing? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's going to take us down to ordinances. And our first ordinance is ordinance three. All these ordinances are on second reading. And the first ordinance is ordinance 3276. Mr. Dorman. An ordinance closing streets and unoccupied utility easements within an area bounded generally on the north by 12th Avenue, the east by the eastern planted boundary of Lynn's addition to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and West Street. The south by the southern platted boundary of Lynn's addition to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and on the west by Washington Street, including those portions of Ramsey Street, Hester Street, Knobloch Street, 13th Avenue, 14th Avenue, 15th Avenue, and any alleys and easements located within said boundary, and further including blocks 1 through 16, Lynn's addition to Stillwater, Oklahoma, blocks 10 through 12 of Duncan's addition to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and blocks 12 and 13 of Sunnyside addition to Stillwater, Oklahoma, as shown on the recorded plats thereof. Any questions on Ordinance 3276? Again, this is the area that was platted but never developed. Yes, on okay. 12th Street. Right. 12th and Hesterish. Move approval Ordinance 3276. Second. Motion and a second to approve Ordinance 3276. As approved four to zero. And that will take us down to ordinance 3277. An ordinance approving and adopting the Stillwater North Perkins project plan, designating and adopted project area and increment district boundaries, establishing a date for creation of increment district number one, City of Stillwater, adopting certain findings, authorizing the City of Stillwater to carry out and administer the project plan establishing a tax apportionment fund, declaring apportioned funds to be special funds of the city of Stillwater or alternative authorized entity, authorizing the use of sales tax increment revenues for the payment or financing of certain project costs, authorizing the use of other resources to pay for or finance project costs, 
authorizing the Stillwater Economic Development Authority or alternative authorized entity to issue apportionment notes and to carry out certain provisions of the project plan, ratifying and confirming the actions, recommendations, and findings of the Review Committee and the Planning Commission, directing continuing apportionment, and providing for severability. Okay. You want to read that again? Not particularly. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay. All right, second reading of this ordinance. Now, do we need a motion before we can discuss? You can discuss. And okay, let's discuss. Or I guess, is there discussion? Are there questions for staff? Mr. Batchelor. Uh, I have some discussion and a question. And I'm going to start with uh, my question about, I, I believe Mr. Johnson said something about uh, the traffic and the cost the city would have to incur to improve, I'm assuming, the intersection at Lakeview and Perkins, correct? And I know that we've done a traffic study pretty recently that uh, came back as uh, less than desirable. I don't remember the rating, but it was not a good rating. Uh, and that was before we were talking about retail. So I am under the assumption that this will uh, take, we will have to improve that intersection. Do you agree with me? Yes and no. <laughs> Let me. Uh, the traffic study we, we, we've done, our traffic analysis of, of North Perkins, and in fact, we have uh, submitted application to the State Department of Transportation for state participation in that project. It is a state highway. Um, we are in their eight-year program. We're hoping that within two years we can see a development of improvements to that highway section. Any developer. Um, be it a single store or a multiple store uh, retail shopping center, are required to do a little bit different type of traffic impact analysis. They will hire a traffic engineer to look at the estimated and future traffic generated by that facility and see what additional impact it has over our current study. If there the traffic engineer shows that that has an additional impact and creates additional needs for traffic signals or improvements beyond what we have planned, the developer will be responsible for paying that, not the city. So we will not have to pay additionally to build something to accommodate their traffic. They have to do a study and we have to review that. And if they're going to create more impact, they have to pay those costs. Okay. Okay, so that was my uh, question. And then I just have some comments because I wasn't here. Let my comments be known uh, the last time you discussed this. So um, I appreciate what the businessmen who have been in Stillwater for a long time uh, came up here to say. And you can tell me not to look at what's coming, but uh, my conscience says I have to. I can just look at it as a development, but we all know what's coming, and we've known and we've announced it, and so I appreciate that they stepped up and, and said some concerns. And I would like to know from either of them, have you ever asked the city to help you, or do, have you, do you know that the city has plans or has a plan that uh, you could apply for some type of, of help to, uh, with your businesses, or have you ever been offered anything like that? I've never, I've never been offered, I've never asked them, ever asked them. I, I, didn't, I don't know of anything that's available. Okay, and have you ever said that uh, you were for this plan, and either one of you, or that uh, it wouldn't hurt your business? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm for competition, and I'm for fair play, and I'm for uh, smart plan development in Stillwater.
But I think that uh, as a city councilor, I was elected by people who need me to use my voice to help them. And I've, I've talked to a lot of people in Stillwater who like this. I've talked to a lot of people in Stillwater who do not like it. And um, I think if someone wants to come to Stillwater, they should be able to come to Stillwater, but they should, uh, they should not have to be incentivized to do so. I'm done. Huh? Can I have the business professor? I have a question for him. Can you come to the podium? You're a business professor, correct? You said? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I guess my question to you is, as a business professor, and you, I guess you stated um, in your statement that if you had students, you would tell them to go and ask a city if it was offered to get financing. Is that, was that, did I hear you correctly? Sure. Okay. Yes. I mean, if, if money's on the table, you would be a fool not to take it. Okay. Uh, sorry, you can keep going. I have a follow up to that. Um, but, I mean, just, uh, and I don't, I don't know the situation very much was going on here. It seems like uh, there's a party that is already interested in development and now there's a negotiation going on. But we're not treating this as a negotiation. We're treating this as if we have to do something to get the company to come. Um, usually there would be a negotiation like there was with the Bass Pro Shop where they, 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 the company doesn't want to come there. The city says, we would like to get you to come there. What's it going to take? And you go back and forth and you agree on a price. Instead, it, it seems like what's going on here is that a business says, hey, we'd like to locate here. It makes sense. They must have done some study to figure out this looks like a good location. It's a, on a state highway. There's lots of traffic. Um, but they must have done some initial planning, I, don't, I, don't, I assume. Um, and then they said, hey, why don't we ask if the city will give us, uh, you know, 25% of our development costs back. Um, seems like a good business plan to ask for that. Okay. And my, my second question, as a, I guess, do you teach entrepreneurs or anything, type, anything like that? I teach uh, strategic management. I, the entrepreneurship department is actually a different department. Okay. Um, so. so I don't know if this, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this, and if you don't feel qualified to answer it, that's fine. But I mean, if you were to be addressing people who wanted to start a business, would you say that starting a business is a risk? Would you be in Definitely is that? a risk, yes. And so that if you start a business, I mean, someone could come in next to you, someone could do something that causes your business to succeed or fail? Yes. But that's a risk that you're taking Yes. With starting a business? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has questions. Um, I, I, I'll end my discussion. Well, my point in asking those questions is, and although I do understand your guys' concern as, as business people, um, and I understand that, I, I kind of like that you said you're not even saying the competition that you do like it. You're more just saying of a handout. Um, and I understand that, and I just... As a, I mean, as a, as a, I hate saying younger person, but as a younger person, I know there's a lot of uh, opportunities for people to go a lot of different places, and I feel like as a city, we have to be doing things that are different or that are competing with those other cities as well. And I feel like, from my standpoint and from what I see, other cities are doing this, and to stay competitive, um, I feel like this type of project is something we have to do. I agree with Gene in the fact of, you know, if someone were to say, well, I want to put a sporting store right next to Dupree's and my sale's only going to be this small amount, that's not something I think we would be wanting to look for. But something of this magnitude, and it's not a store, it's, it's a developer then, and we also have more areas in Stillwater that maybe down the road could have these major developments. So I feel like it's something that we as a city and as officials have almost a duty to put something like this for our community. And that's kind of where I stand in. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your, your comments, I, I do. And I, chair, I did chair the TIF committee, just for those of you that representing the council. And Mr. Bashel was correct that the committee did support the proposal unanimously. And just to go back a ways, and I hope I don't gum things up by, by bringing this up, but there is a policy issue here. 
this is more than just about a street or a developer and picking a business. We've determined as a council and as a TIF district that that area needs development. And we've talked a great deal around this horseshoe about quality of life, improving opportunities for people so that they stay in Stillwater, they shop in Stillwater. And so from a policy perspective, it does make sense. I supported several years ago an initiative to bring a specific business to town. And that's picking winners and losers. But the reason, the policy reason why I was supportive of that is because we had a resolution from the Student Government Association that asked us specifically, sent a letter to the mayor and the council, saying we want this business. We want this restaurant. And from that policy perspective, if the students at OSU who are such an important part of our community are asking us for this, we should consider it. Because there was obviously a hole in our retail community. We weren't providing this thing that they wanted. And there was a lot of concern about the impact it would have on other businesses, uh, namely Da Vinci's. And I swear I eat at Da Vinci's three or four times a month, and every time we have to wait to get a table. I've eaten at Olive Garden one time, right after it opened. But the students enjoy it. And so once in a while, we have to make a policy decision and look past some of the, some of the other issues. And I, I think it's a good initiative, and I think we should support it. It's on second reading. We've already supported it once, and I think we need to follow through. I would, I'm, I'm gonna disagree with one comment you made. I may have, misheard you okay. so please, please correct me no straighten me out if I, I i i think you made a comment that i think simplifies things way too much and you talked about how the vote city council made several years ago was picking winners and losers this I, isn't this i is could a develop i i disagree with back then picking winners and losers well, government doesn't pick that I, that's made. a comment made and i think it's way too simplified because it implies that a decision here makes every decision after this and decides who goes to what store and who buys what here versus where they buy something somewhere else. True. I think it simplifies it way too much. Now, a very valid point that was made tonight was, does it give an advantage now that was not available or is not offered before? And there's no doubt that that is a factually correct statement. No doubt about it. But I disagree with the comment of picking winners and losers. In my opinion, the consumer decides that. And the consumer decides that based on what a business person does. Well, perhaps I should have said, while the comment was being made, okay. we were picking <laughs> winners and losers. I was looking at the policy issue of should we address a need that the student body was God, I, presenting I to us. I this, on the other hand, is a development. There's multiple pads that will be involved. It's development of a segment of the community that will provide even more opportunity for the folks that are living out on that end of the town, and I think it's a good thing for them. Yeah. Um, I, I, Councilor Noble, you, you made a comment that I, I also agree with, how it is, while the plan is a plan for a development, it's impossible to not look at what the stated right now end result is proposed to be the reason i made the statement that i made is that proposed retailer could disappear tomorrow and this plan is still in place the plan is not dependent on a specific retailer that's why i made the comment that i made earlier but i i, I wholly agree psychologically and mentally you cannot not know things you already know that i completely get I say that again I, just I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, I know that we had a, a good points. So I agree. With so, um, um, no. Did you have some? Well, I just wanted to uh, take this one step further and say that I think that when we do, I wish that when we had uh, looked at this policy initiative to bring the development. Uh, to allow the development, that we had looked at other things that uh, would bring quality of life, which is higher paying jobs. I, I don't, uh, I wish if we were going to do something like this, that it was more than just for 
a development in tax dollars. I would like to see better paying jobs that uh, have benefits and things like that that retailers normally don't. So uh, I know I didn't get what I wanted, but I, uh, if we really want quality of life in Stillwater and a better life for Stillwater, Stillwater is people. It's not a thing, it's people. And uh, we don't have to do what every other city does. We don't have to just follow that step. We can do better, and we, I wish we would have. When we had our economic development study session a month plus ago, and that was, while it was the ongoing step in the public discussion, it is very, been very ongoing in the conversations about economic development. We've been having these conversations for many years, and they were happening years before that, before they were official conversations. And this proposed plan, to me, it doesn't meet every possible aspect of our economic development policies or meet every goal of what we hope to accomplish from an economic development front. There's not one project in the world that could do that. And so trying to put a standard that one project can accomplish everything from an economic development front is, is an unfair thing to try and have it do. But I do think that this project and this plan do hit many of those economic development goals and policies that we have been promoting and have been improving Stillwater for several years. This the specific here is if the projections are anywhere near accurate and if the reports of what is spent outside of Stillwater that could be being spent inside in Stillwater are anywhere near accurate the return on investment for the city as a whole with this project will be spectacular. The money from this type of project, we're losing a lot of this, these sales to other communities. How do we stop that? How do we also get people from other communities to be spending more of their money here. To me, this project, not, not to the same numbers by any stretch, but conceptually could have the same impact that was described as the Bass Pro Shops. The people that live in the surrounding area that are driving to Oklahoma City or Tulsa to be buying the type of goods that are going to be sold out of this development that are not currently available in Stillwater that's where the return on investment is spectacular for Stillwater. And that's one of the major areas where I think it hits right in the heart of our economic development policies. Mr. Galloway, you had a comment. I just wanted to clear up what the professor was saying about how it appears this happened. And, and I just want to clear this up that this was negotiated. This has been being negotiated for nearly a year. But it goes back further than that. It goes back five years. You know, five years ago, we started implementing economic development projects like this for one reason. The mayor is just discussing it. When you look at the sales tax we collect in Stillwater today, these are big numbers, people spend approximately $700 million per year in Stillwater for taxable goods. We learned five years ago in some analysis of the market that over $300 million are, being, are leaving Stillwater every year to go to Oklahoma City and Tulsa and other places to be spent for things that they can't buy here. And so that's when we started looking at how do we capture some of that $300 million and keep it at home. 
because evidently people are buying $300 million worth of stuff somewhere else that they don't feel they can buy here. Uh, a couple of quick numbers I think are important. We started, and the reason I say five years ago, we entered our first tax increment rebate agreement. It didn't require a TIF district. It was small. It was for $11,600. It started a brand new business. We have entered 14. We've actually entered 16. Two of them are too new. They haven't started yet. 14 agreements that are the same model as this development. The smallest one was $11,688. The largest one was $950,000 rebate. In that five-year period, those 14 businesses have created over $2.5 million of new sales tax that wasn't being created because those stores didn't exist. We've returned a half million of it and put 1.8 in the bank. Plus, that $2.5 million is captured because a lot of people would have gone outside the city for some of those products. So it's kind of a proven model. And, and, I, and I truly understand and respect the competition thing, but I, I think that studies also show that the competition actually creates more business. And Mr. Weaver, the example, we follow very closely. I look in 2011, that's before that restaurant you were talking about. The total amount of money people were spending in Stillwater in 2011 at eating and drinking places, that's the way it's coded in the taxes, was $100 million. In three years, this year we just finished, people spent $125 million for eating and drinking in Stillwater. The two or three new restaurants that have opened didn't do $25 million worth of business. But the fact that we have more and more restaurants are attracting that much more money into the community. So when you increase the total sales of all restaurants by 25% and only had two or three new ones open, everybody was a winner. Now the, the customers do, the public do, pick and choose. But our records show that the business level of all restaurants has risen and not gone down since we've incentivized new ones. Now that won't, that won't be true for every business. And we try, not to, we try not to negotiate with direct competitors that's exactly the same as what we've got. We really do in our policy try to negotiate with developers who will bring a new element to our shopping quality of life for the public so they can find things or a type of thing or product or service they don't feel they're able to find here now. And if they can do that, we keep the money at the home and everybody wins. But it was, and there, that's a story for the long story, but it wasn't just them coming in and saying, we want money. This was a negotiator. We started five years ago <clears throat> putting a lot of information out both locally and all over the country to say, we need some development in our community to capture some of that $300 million and keep it at home. Our biggest, and we've said this over and over and over again in all of our meetings, our biggest hope is that local business people and local developers will call Angel McLaughlin or me and say, there's a three acre site, we want to get creative and expand our business or start a second business or a new business and try to capture some of that $300 million and we'll work with them. Because this developer happens to be from South Carolina, it doesn't it doesn't matter whether South Carolina, Alabama, most importantly, they should be from Stillwater. And we hope we do something. But we're also going to have outside investors wanting to invest in Stillwater. And so we're going to have $13.5 million, if this is approved, spent on construction in Stillwater. That's going to be another value. And over and above, you know, it's temporary jobs, temporary construction money, but it's $13.5 million spent in our community just to build and develop. Are they hiring local people? Yes. Now, I, I can't guarantee 100% of them are, but Mr. Ghost is, is working uh, for them, and to my knowledge, they're using local contractors, local engineers, local architects, and uh, that's money we're coming So anyway, that's just a little additional background I hope relates to some of the questions that we're asked.
I'll, 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 I would just like to Mr. Rodkins, if you I would just like to challenge. I've, I've heard a lot here, and you know, and we've talked about us paying our taxes, but you know, we talked about um, you know Oklahoma City and what they've done with their downtown area and, and their entertainment district. Well, Chris and I are, are in the entertainment district, so why can't we look at? fixing some of our existing our, our buildings are all run down and it, you know, our streets are not good down there and it's but we're in we we are within a mile of half the population of Stillwater the students live around us and, and you made mention that the students wanted Olive Garden mm -hmm. I can't imagine the, st the students not wanting to fix up around the campus and the entertainment district so I would just challenge everybody to take a look at that the existing structures we've had the people who have been here that have been paying i would we, love to set up a tiff district that would connect downtown yeah. to the southeast corner of I mean, water I, I, I just challenge the city to, to take a look and at that because i think that. if location 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 is important we've got the location we've got the entertainment district if we're trying to mimic what oklahoma city's done we're in the area that you know that can succeed at that so absolutely now that, that's exactly what i was trying to say and again don't get wrong the city can't go in and spend money and start businesses. But if somebody wants to take some of that property and redevelop it, come and talk to us. This council is supportive of working with local people to do exactly that. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. No doubt. And I hope people step forward and want well, to And we've actually already rate, 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 laid the groundwork for that with the overlay district that runs from Washington all the way around past Duck and north on Hall of Fame. We're laying the groundwork again with the conversation about form-based codes that will allow in a more cohesive, more flexible type of developments for very unique areas, such as this the area you're discussing. So the groundwork is laid and ready to roll. We, we need private sector stepping up. That's the next step that we need specifically in that area because we've, we've got rules ready to go that will make it extreme in comparison to before make it much easier and much better from a rural standpoint we also have the economic development mindset and policies that will dovetail together very nicely with that so that we have an overall raise the ship you've got retail you've got housing you've got quality of life all the different areas all trying to come together it's there waiting to pop. One more thing I would like to say. <clears throat> I just want to say to both of you, Dupree Sports, Chris's University, I hope, I know people will continue. Uh, you are our habit, and that's where <laughs> we go. And I want to encourage people to continue to support just like everybody in Stillwater always has, but I appreciate both of you because you have invested in Stillwater because you love Stillwater and because you've raised families here and because this is your home. And that's different, in my opinion, than any developer can ever be. I appreciate you. I appreciate that when I open a high school program for football, that I see your names there, that you are the sponsors. I don't, you know, sometimes you don't see big corporate sponsors. In fact, you know, we don't. We see you. So I appreciate everything you've done for this community, and uh, I appreciate your lifetime investment. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, conversation? We have ordinance 3277. Is there a motion on ordinance 3277? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 3277 on second reading. And that is approved three to one with Councillor Noble voting no. Okay, that's going to take us down to ordinance 3278. Mr. Dorman. In ordinance amending the Stillwater City Code by amending chapter 29, Motor Vehicles and Traffic, Article 6, Pedestrians, by amending section 29-187, Pedestrians Soliciting Rides or Business, 
by adding new section B providing for an exception, new section C providing requirements for issuance of a permit, and new section D providing a penalty for violation and declaring an emergency. Assuming that the first part would be voted affirmatively, you need a second motion on the emergency clause? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, any questions on ordinance 3278? Is there a motion on 3278? Make a motion to approve 3278. Second. A motion a second to approve ordinance 3278 on second reading. That's approved four to zero. Is there a motion on the declaring an emergency? Motion to declare emergency. Okay. Second. Motion and a second. Declaring an emergency. <laughs> and that is approved four to zero. Okay, that's gonna take us down to reports from officers and boards. Mr. Dorman, anything? Nothing to report tonight, sir. Mr. Galloway? Nothing further to report. Okay. Counselors, you guys have anything? Okay. I didn't say anything last week because we didn't have all our students back in session, but now we do. I think they're all here now. They're all back in session now, <laughs> uh, both uh, at OSU, NOC, and uh, our public schools. So I hope everyone has a wonderful fall semester. Okay. Anything for upcoming meetings? Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Speaking of upcoming meetings, next Monday would be our regular meeting, but that is a federal holiday, Labor Day, so our meeting will be the Thursday. What's the number? The 4th. September 4th will be our next regular scheduled City Council meeting. And due to an OSU board meeting on that same day, I will be absent. Okay. Councilor Vice Mayor Weaver will not be here that day. Okay. All right. If Nothing else for upcoming meetings. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Sick. Motion and a second to adjourn. As approved four to zero, we are adjourned.